Good evening. Hello, everyone. Hi, I'm Susan Kukuchka from the State Library of Queensland, and I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land, the Turrbal people and the Yugara people, and pay respects to their ancestors who came before them. Today we're proud to present Survival and Resilience in partnership with Griffith Review and as part of our Deep in the Conversation program. So the State Library's Deep in the Conversation program is a series of talks, debates and conversations with leading thinkers designed to share and stimulate ideas. And as most of you know, Griffith Review is an award-winning quarterly featuring the best Australian writers and thinkers writing across all genres. Each themed edition explores a pressing contemporary issue and it provides a bridge between the expertise of specialists and the curiosity of readers. The latest edition, Griffith Review 35, Surviving, explores the narratives of tragedy and survival, drawing on official reports and historical records to unravel the complexity of, and impact of both natural and man-made disasters. And if you're interested, copies of the edition will be available for sale after the event. Tonight's talk also complements the State Library's Floodlines program. Floodlines is State Library's latest exhibition, which opens here on Saturday the 7th of April. And the exhibition remembers the great floods of 1893 in the Philip Bacon Heritage Gallery, which is on level four. And it also commemorates the recent floods with a digitally immersive exhibition created by the community in SLQ Gallery, which is just down here on level two. Tonight we're very privileged to host a panel of speakers including Chief Executive of Green Cross Australia, Mara Bunn, Editor of Courier Mail's Q Weekend, Matthew Condon, and Professor of Humanities at Griffith University, Sydney Decker. And this panel will be chaired by Brisbane-based broadcaster from ABC's Radio National, Dr Kate Evans. So following our conversation with the speakers, there'll be an opportunity for audience questions. And just to let you know, we are recording this talk. So please just wait for a roving microphone to reach you before you ask your questions. And um, also be aware that we're video recording this evening's discussion for our online webcast and for broadcast on ABC's Big Ideas. If you have any concerns with this, please come and see one of the staff members. And if you'd like to comment on the talk while it's happening tonight, please use the Twitter hashtag. We've just got here up on the screen. Um, that's all from me, and I will now hand over to our facilitator to start the conversation. Thank you, Kate. Thank you very much, Susan. And as you heard, I am Kate Evans, and we are recording the event for broadcast on ABCRN. So please do bear that in mind, because of course we do want to hear your questions, but we don't want to hear your mobile phone ring. So hello and welcome again to this survival and resilience discussion with Griffith Review, the State Library of Queensland's Floodlines Exhibition Program, and as part of Big Ideas on ABCRN. And in the context of both past and ongoing floods, fires, cyclones and other disasters, both very recently and those from a year and more ago, today we're going to talk in particular about survival and resilience. And we're going to do so from a range of perspectives from reportage, bearing witness and telling stories, from listening and rebuilding with an emphasis on collaboration, and from an analysis of mistakes and what this means for both ethics and governance. And we might ask, where does individual suffering and grief fit in? Where's the space for both acknowledging it and recovering? So given those questions, our panel tonight can deal, I think, with all of those questions and many more. And they have indeed addressed those issues in the latest Griffith Review, which focuses on surviving what we might call random acts. But perhaps we could start with journalist and author Matthew Condon. Matt, how does your role as a journalist change as disasters unfold? Is it simply about perspective on an event and the stories you have access to? Or do you find your ethical and analytic um, perspectives shift with time? Well, it's, a, it's a, in a sense, it's a combination of both because um, during that um, terrible week in January, I was, I was um, on the street, in the, literally in the city, reporting on a day-to-day -day basis and observing. Um, but it was later when um, Julianne, Griffith, um, Julianne Schultz, the editor of the Griffith Review, um, almost nonchalantly said, well, look, why don't you um, go through and follow the flood commission of inquiry? and um, see if we can't extract uh, the grand human narrative from 
what ultimately was uh, 5,500 pages of um, transcript and about seven or 800 submissions from the public. And I ag immediately agreed, not thinking clearly about the um, length and breadth of the work that was involved in doing that. But I'm glad I did it because, as a reader, I wanted to understand the sequence of events. How did it happen? How could this possibly happen? And it took me on the journey f from 2010, um, when there was talk of um, La Nina and, and all of that, very high-powered talks in government, um, mid to late 2010. And um, so, you know, many people in this city knew that something was coming. And, um, and yet the bulk of us were shocked and surprised in, in January. So there was a disconnect, in a sense, of if you look in hindsight, of, of how government um, um, addressed this uh, growing scenario to us, and how, or more, more to the point, how they didn't. And I think the Commission of Inquiry, in its final um, extended period, highlighted that um, the average member of the public was not necessarily taken into the confidence of government on something that was so vital and crucial and is still having an impact on us today. And it seems to me, reading your piece in Griffith's Review, that it sits somewhere between regular journalism and a formal commission inquiry, and it's, it's very powerful, emotional stuff. But what is it for you as a writer? Is it about bearing witness, wanting those stories to be told and retold? Yes, it is. It's, it's, um, it, it, I was here in 74, and a lot of people here probably were too, and... Um, um, it's human nature that we forget. And I think we, we have to tell stories again and again to, uh, to not forget. And I felt it was my responsibility, in a sense, too, to do a piece like this um, so that it keeps the story alive, you know, in, in that human sense. I mean, the Commission of Inquiry transcripts, are, uh, a lot of them are fantastically dull and um, full of legalese and banter and debate and and um, engineers speak and dam levels and how dams operate. And, but I knew that inside there were the human, the great, was the great human drama. And I have literally only touched on it in, that, in the essay that I've done. Um, but it was enough. It struck home for me. And I, There's a book there, but I wouldn't want to, want to write that book because um, um, there's some painful stuff in there. But I wanted to reveal the human story, essentially. So, Mara Boon, then, as Chief Executives of Green Cross Australia, what does story gathering mean to you? I imagine it means something different. Is it about consultation, acknowledging loss, or is it always about what comes next? I think all of the above. Um, it was interesting. Uh, when the events unfolded, uh, Green Cross had received a grant from the Natural Disaster Resilience Program to build a portal for Queensland that captured the history of 150 years of severe weather. Uh, and that's now live. It's called uh, hardenup.org, Protecting Queensland. And in that history, we trawled through the Bureau of Meteorology's archives, looking at the 1863 flood, the 1974 flood. In fact, we have 3,262 events going back 150 years. So there are lots of stories in those. And um, I guess guided by some of the senior uh, meteorologists and retired meteorologists who have spent a lot of time trying to understand the history of weather, um, I guess the story that really connected with me the most, um, talking to Jeff Callaghan, the retired uh, senior forecaster who guided this project, his reflection was that... Um, in actual fact, the 20th century has been a very quiet period in terms of severe weather compared to the century before, and many people felt that since 2004 that was reverting. So, um, you know, all kinds of discussions about the gradual impacts of climate change and how that plays out against severe weather trends, but going back to the pure cyclical nature of severe weather, just understanding that those stories from history were now coming alive against a cycle which could be much more severe. Um, the other thing is uh, we've done quite a bit of work on sustainable rebuilding uh, for Black Saturday-affected communities, and I've spent quite some time living in the caravans um, in, in places like Flowerdale and Marysville and, and King Lake and capturing those stories. And it's that thing about um, in the, the depth of the, the, the sheer just suffering and uh, you know, un overwhelming sense of helplessness and lack of control these beautiful stories of renewal 
and opportunities for communities to come together and build something different. And for me, um, that is the major story. How do we build for the 21st century, especially if in Australia it is to be one of greater events like the ones that we suffered? How do we build stories of renewal that really um, mitigate against future disaster and create different kinds of community and economic development? And yet your analysis in the Griffith Review suggests, though, that the timing of the storytelling is crucial. When people choose to listen, how quickly they choose to respond. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, in a sense, it's, it's less about sort of storytelling for the public, although that's um, always so important because people follow, you know, the journey through the media. I think it's more about how communities engage when disasters occur. And one thing that we've learned in case studies like Greensburg, Kansas, for example, which is uh, the subject of a documentary that is an unbelievable story in the Kansas heartland, the most conservative Republican part of America, a small, uh, largely corn-growing uh, community, completely wiped out by a tornado in 2007, deliberated intensively for a period of nine weeks to think about options going forward and came out of it saying that they were going to be the most sustainable small town in America. And the story of that unfolding, the magic of the hospital they've built, the city hall, the police station, the business incubator, platinum-rated residences that have zero energy bills and very low water bills. And for that to come out of such a tragedy, to me the secret was about how they paused to consider what's possible and to engage not in a political level, not in a level of um, sort of who's to blame or, you know, just more at that level of, wow, okay, we have a catastrophe, but we have an opportunity. And I think that kind of storytelling for me is, is the really, really exciting one. How do communities be, become empowered to really direct a very different future? But Sydney Decker, you, it seems to me, have made a career of finding out who's to blame, of looking at disasters and examining <laughs> mistakes, finding <laughs> errors, systemic failures. Is that what storytelling allows for you about finding gaps in the narratives, finding where things went wrong, how things might be done better? Just for the record, my career is organised around finding those who find those to blame. <laughs> um, because uh, finding people to blame for these things is obviously a, a hugely comforting but also a very limiting device. And, and I suppose my, my reply to this would sit on the, uh, on the border between Matt's uh, answer and, and, and Mara's, which is, um, although we launch these official inquiries that, yes, find ultimately people to point the finger at, and surprise, surprise, this is often a, a lower-level person who should have zigged but zacked instead. Uh, and this we only know in hindsight, obviously. And the pressure under which these decisions are made is often completely underestimated by those who sit there, have plenty of time to deliberate, drink coffee, go home, think about it again. By that time, they had 90 seconds for that decision. Right? So, um, but the, the confusion that seems to occur to me is that these our supposed inquiries and post-disaster events or post-disaster activities that are organized around trying to find out what went wrong, to use Matt's language, to use Matt's characterization, what went wrong? Um, an epistemological question, a question about knowledge, in other words. I think, though, that really what we're doing is asking existential questions. Why does suffering occur? Why does suffering occur there and then? Why is it this baby that dies or this family whose house gets destroyed and not their neighbors? How is that possible? The sheer randomness riles us when it comes to suffering. And that we want to control. I think that the reports we write are never about the past. They're about the future. They are about trying to divine the future, trying to control the future, trying to say, oh, if we only tell the engineers to follow the procedure more carefully, this will never happen again. And we sell this illusion to each other, and we vote governments on this, or don't for that matter, but um, we, we, we believe that by writing about the past, we can divine the future. But the more meaningful part of this is what Mara was saying, I think, that the future is more about turning that suffering around. Um, finding meaning in suffering by 
doing something different from what you were doing. Where does it place nature and culture, though? I mean, does it also suggest that there are no such things as natural events, that they are all events that we are a part of and can control or respond to? I don't think you can ever close the debate on that question. Even in floods, you can ask, well, why do we live in Brisbane? You know, why did people settle this area? Why do we always want to live on rivers? Why do we have 80% of the world population living near the coast? This is really a bad idea, given global warming. Right? So to what extent is human control involved? But I think the illusion and the hope of human control is 100% involved. We tend to overestimate ourselves, uh, particularly since the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment. We feel very good about our ability to control nature. Well, one of the, the things that, of course, doesn't control nature but keeps a close eye on it, and it was interesting that both Matt and Mara mentioned the Bureau of Meteorology, um, it has a particular political role in this story, doesn't it, Matt? And you identify a, p a particular moment that shifts in our, well, in both the floods and our understanding of it. Can you talk about that? I, I just love how meteorologists have become the sort of rock stars of, <laughs> of, of our century. It's fantastic. <laughs> how does that they, they could never have imagined it, and, <laughs> and um, bless them. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> um, well, I think you're referring to that historic meeting with Cabinet last year, is that right? In yes, well, you, you talk about that, that moment when politics and the Bureau of Meteorology come together quite explicitly, and I think the head of the Bureau actually briefed the Queensland That's State right. Cabinet. It was a first, and um, I mean, it, uh, it was, wasn't until the inquiry that I learned that it actually happened. Um, and I found it fascinating that um, the head of the, the Bureau literally briefed... Um, former Premier Bly's cabinet on the, the next few months and what was, what was about to arrive on our doorstep. Um, they were pretty right. They were, they were ac ac actually very accurate in terms of how it unfolded. But what fascinates me is how, and I include myself, in that um, we can read snippets here and there from these new rock stars um, saying, um, you know, this event is... Um, is, is a potential factor in our summer of 2010-11. Uh, yet I was grumbling about the rain all through December and, you know, the clothes won't dry and how are we going to, you know, entertain the children when they, they can't go to the park. And So all of these tiny little incremental things that occupy our human lives um, can blind us to um, the bigger picture. So I was as surprised as anybody when especially on that Wednesday in January when the, um, the river roared through the CBD, the CBD's power had been cut. And it, was a, it was an unnerving um, experience, but um, all the signs were there. Yet I, I and I, I'm sure many others hadn't joined the dots, if you like. And Sydney, that was the week that you arrived in Australia to begin your new job, is that right? Yes, yes, indeed. Um, so we, we did two things to, uh, to plan for disaster. Uh, but b before, I, before I give those away, um, just to respond to Matt very briefly, connecting the dots, this is actually a finding that is consistent across intelligence failures throughout history. The, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the, uh, the Yom Kippur War, um, all of the information to be able to predict that these disasters or things were going to happen was, in hindsight, there. What, what wasn't there was the meta-analysis, the meta-intelligence to put these things together and give them predictive value and political power to do something with it, which is probably where we need to look, not necessarily the intelligence gathering, but the meta-analysis over it and the political courage to do something with that. Um, but uh, uh, we were still in Europe uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the eve of the crest of the floods, indeed, and, uh, or two eves. Um, and I, I called my, my prospective employer. I said, you know, yeah, you told me you're booked a hotel, but from my reading of what's going on in Brisbane, you've got families in these hotels falling through the windows because they're all full of refugees. And uh, so he started making some phone calls, called me back. He said, no, 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 it isn't that bad. Your room is still there. And so I was already surprised. I said, okay, well, let's try. And, of course, the airport is in Pinkamba, which is very low down and, and which, which was almost threatened to be flooded. Um, so we weren't even sure that the plane could land that very night. Um, the very next day, uh, 
um, uh, violating all kinds of commitments to uh, green driving. I, I bought myself a, a four-wheel drive um, <laughs> and a house that is uh, 53 meters over sea level. So <laughs> the thing is, you look at Toowoomba, which is 700 meters over sea level, and you get no guarantees in this wacky country whatsoever. You know, everything seems upside down. You know, water flowing up the hill. It's I don't know. But, so. Well, both Sydney and Mara, you both bring international perspectives to what's happened in Australia. Mara, should we be looking to other overseas models for recovery? And I'm not just talking about about Brisbane, but looking at the way that we deal with disasters in Australia. Um, yeah, and I think we also have a lot to teach the world. I think it's a global challenge and with 7 billion of us moving towards 9, you know, it will become more precarious and we can learn more from each other. I love the lesson of um, how technology and social media can empower communities to actually do that meta interface. It doesn't have to be just at the bureau and at the government level. And my favorite story of that is about the fishermen of Bangladesh and what happened when they started all having mobile phones. And quickly they begin to understand, they take them out to sea, and they could see when the storm surge was coming and when the big storms were coming. And they would share that, communi- that knowledge in a very viral way. And in the deltas, particularly where the mangrove systems have been eroded, they would quickly move you know, to other places. And I think um, f- one of the challenges that we have in... Um, this, uh, this, this, this equation of you know, more people in vulnerable areas with more events, and oh my goodness, what do we do? It's almost like we have to turn on its head a paradigm which is so familiar, right? And the paradigm is um, someone will be there to take care of you. The government, the police, the SES, the Red Cross, someone will be there to take care of you. And we run elections, um, you know, quite rightfully saying we're going to hire more of these people who are going to be there. Trust us, we will be there to take care of you. And the grim reality is no one will be there in the first 72 hours if it is a major event, and in some cases much longer than that. And so who will be there is us. And it's us as individuals, it's with our children and our pets, it's with our neighbors and our communities. And so how do we then, in a sense, encourage governments to step back and empower the community to step up so we stop becoming brain dead thinking about pizza when it's raining and understanding that we are up for a major event? And I I, I want to be clear here because, um, you know, there is the kind of a seasonal thing. It's a big La Nina. We can see the ocean temperatures. It's about to happen. And then there is the slower playing urgency. And here's one that I'm very concerned about. If you talk to Roger Tomlinson, who's an engineer with Griffith University in the Climate Change Adaptation Center, um, he understands uh, Southeast Queensland's coast extremely well. He's been working in this area for many decades. And he will tell you that in the records, going back even into the paleontology records, there is a major weather event every 30 to 40 years. And uh, I live in the hinterland behind the Gold Coast, right? We haven't had one since the late 60s. There were three cyclones that veered close with a major East Coast low in the middle in 1967. For people that were around at that time, the police, the guard came out. They were out there for three weeks. The Esplanade went out to see homes were lost. 42,000 people lived on the Gold Coast at that time. There were no canal developments, right? So in Morton Bay, it's a very shallow water environment. And when a storm surge builds, it goes over the island and back through the broad water and out to sea. In this part of Queensland, we will have a major event at some stage, and we're up for it now. (laughs) Now, how do I talk about that without sounding like a complete lunatic? (laughs) You know, so it's like, yeah, we have to learn from, you know, the Europeans and the Americans. Well, we have to actually learn from our own history, and we have to somehow tell these stories in a way where we can... I don't know, have fun with it, but also be quite serious because do you know who lives on the Gold Coast? Lots of people who have artificial hips like me. (laughs) A lot of retirees who come from different parts of Australia who don't understand what a major event like that actually is. So it's a, it's a, it's, Social media is the most powerful tool that we have for people to share stories. And, uh, and then there are very practical things that we can do to protect our homes, our families, our communities. The Harden Up program is all about that. Volunteering Queensland, Red Cross, many other community groups you know, are involved in this area. And, uh, you know, the fact that the police service and the SES are so advanced in social media now in Queensland is sensational news. It all bodes very well. But we really need to wake up. 
We live. Well, I think the Gold Coast should have an artificial hip emergency response team, <laughs> <laughs> choppers, and especially for the Gold Coast. I was uh, I was born in Amsterdam, which of course is essentially below sea level. Um, but the Dutch had their had their their worst flood in 1953, uh, the most recent worst flood, uh, and and since then they've been building their way out of the problem. Um, so the Dutch an- answer would be better engineering. But in some sense, they have, they, it's easy for them to say because the Dutch will never be afflicted by this terrible uh, conundrum posed in Australia. You know, do you want drinking water or do you want your city flooded? You know, which will it be, pest or cholera? There is plenty of water in the Netherlands, you know, maybe a bit filthy because it comes dribbling down the Rhine from Germany. But, you know, basically there is water to drink, right? Whereas here, you know, for eight years, things started looking uh, pretty dismal. Right? And, and so you're caught in this terrible double bind in terms of policy making, governance, where to put the threshold. And of course, in hindsight, you're always wrong. Whatever you do, you can't win on that decision. Can, can I jump in there and be incredibly rude? I, you know, I, 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 I know, oh my goodness, she's going to talk about climate change. Ah! Those words. Um, uh, the latest CSIRO research indicates that 42% of Australians do not believe that climate change is the fundamental driver uh, in terms of human-induced factors. So I'm very mindful that many people in the audience just don't buy that, and that's fine. But uh, we are very informed by the science and very concerned by the risks that are presented. And in communicating those risks, here's the pickle, right? It's about variability and uncertainty. Mm. And if you look at the record annually of rainfall and temperature in different parts of Queensland, what you find is we go, El Nino, El Nino, El Nino, less rainfall, La Nina. El Nino, El Nino, La Nina. But the trend of that variation is gradually up on temperature and in most of Queensland gradually down Down on on rainfall, but in some parts up as well. So we have to get our heads around in Brisbane becoming the world's best water saving, not washing our car, drought busting, you know, sort of community. And then all of a sudden having mass amounts of water on a a parched land. And how challenging is that? Mm. But also how challenging is the politics of it? And given that the, um, the sort of the ghost flood that lay behind what happened last year in Brisbane was here at least 1974 and then 1893, there was also, of course, Cyclone Tracy in the mid-70s. And after that, at a federal level, um, inquiries happened and some pretty firm conclusions and reports came out saying that there should be a national disaster scheme, for example. And it never happened. So... Given the ghosts of other inquiries, other reports, Matt, where do you see the politics of this? Well, firstly, um, the question of drawing down Wyvernhoe to 75% was um, not mooted but put to the minister at the time, Stephen Robertson, in October, November of 2010. And he responded to that decision in, on December 24, two months later, um, and the, the thinking behind it, and I'm sure he wasn't alone, was that we had gone through a drought for eight years. How can we throw away water? I mean, that, that drought mindset was still a part of the thinking in the midst of this colossal weather event. Um, having said all of that, and having read um, the submissions to the inquiry of human beings literally seeing the water rise uh, one metre per second per minute, I'm sorry, a metre per minute, 10 metres in 10 minutes, and observing 70-tonne rocks in Grantham being rolled down the creek bed by this water. I'm not sure any national disaster strategy could necessarily um, hope to have a, a, a total success rate. You know, nature is nature and weather is what it is. And I don't, you know, nobody could have predicted anything like Grantham. Obviously, those poor people that died and, and suffered um, were like us. Um, they were at the mercy of this, this monstrous event. So whether you can plan for that, I'm, I'm, I'm not certain you can. Given all that, how would you rate the inquiry? Well, I thought it was a disaster until uh, Headley Thomas, um, who had been writing on and off um, the stories that ultimately led to the extension of the commission... Uh, and you look at the recommendations of the Commission, and the strongest recommendations really were a result of Headley Thomas's reporting. Now, if Headley Thomas hadn't sat down with those um, documents, which he did, and I know this because we've discussed it, 
um, for three weeks, seven days a week, and found the story behind the story that actually existed in the documents that had been tendered to the commission. Um, if he hadn't done that, then um, I think it would have been a very, very meek um, report indeed. Well, Mara, if then we, we don't look to governments for solutions, as you suggested, what needs to be done to better make communities respond? I mean, can, can you do disasters well? Yeah, I, I, I'm very optimistic because I feel like we've been banged around and done it so badly so many times we're bound to learn you know, as we go forward. My, my optimism comes from a, a firm belief in the wisdom of, of ordinary Australians. And I think if they're informed and engaged with business, with research, with government, with the community sector, uh, really, really terrific uh, decisions about what's possible can, can be made. And uh, I'll give you an example, and it, it didn't really go anywhere, but it was a moment of hope. <laughs> and that was uh, uh, about six weeks after uh, the events of January, we had a session in Parliament House with about 125 people, uh, which we called Build It Back Green. And we Skyped in from Kansas the architect who had done the master plan for Greensburg, as well as the head of our office in New Orleans, where there's a very different kind of energy mix, sustainable recovery underway in, uh, in, in, in parts of, uh, of the city. And uh, we brought together, I can't tell you how exciting it was. Uh, there would have been, you know, uh, the, the financial institutions, Stocklands, Lynn Lease, um, the Property Council, the Green Building Council, the Insurance Council, Suncorp, uh, Red Cross, uh, QCOS, Habitat for Humanity, uh, about five local governments from the region, five government departments, uh, principals from schools. It was absolutely wonderful, and we came together for a day to imagine, can we build back imaginative uh, infrastructure that uses recycled road base but is designed to be um, you know, respectful of ecosystems and actually uh, more resilient you know, where it's needed to these major events, led by the likes of GHD and you know, Arup and, and, and Manides Roberts and so forth. We talked to principals who wanted to do different things and elevate their schools because they kept flooding every year. Uh, we talked to uh, you know, Stocklands and Lynn Lease about the idea of uh, master plan communities that in, were in areas of risk and how could they be built differently. And all of that we thought could somehow influence what we were imagining was going to be six, seven billion dollars worth of investment, right? Let's do it better. Let's do it greener. Let's do it in a way that reduces bills but also is more durable. And uh, from that came, I think, um, a bit of a PR campaign called Build It Back Better. <laughs> and, uh, you know, some good information resources for people that may have found them on a website. Um, I must say the wonderful work of the Reconstruction Authority around flood maps some very strategic work that's happening on digital elevation maps that will enable people to understand what is storm surge, what is flooding, and also some very, very good work on longer-term planning. How do we think about local planning, uh, you know, given, given hazards? But that aside, the actual investment in the, the rebuilding was just the same. <laughs> and what a shame when the private sector, the community sector, academia, everyone had come together with this great enthusiasm. So, you know, it will happen. And I think partly it didn't happen because, you know, unlike New Orleans where there's, you know, tens of thousands of homes being rebuilt and entire CBDs, you know, sort of lost, this was a much more, um, you know, kind of statewide broad impact as opposed to a narrow intense impact. So at one stage it will, and when it does, uh, we can build in Australia something that we can show the world. And from that will come technologies that can be exported, intellectual property, businesses, it'll be very, very exciting. So the seeds are there for this kind of thinking. So Sydney, how optimistic are you about processes or possibilities that you see for recovery, for resilience? In, in Australia, very optimistic. Uh, the, the reason being that uh, as, a, as a population you seem to shrug off these things despite some of the death and, and or a lot of the death and destruction um, in ways that I, I, I've lived in a, in a number of other countries and, and they, they offer interesting contrast cases. Uh, one would be a Scandinavian country that, that I've spent quite a bit of time in and, uh, and, and lived in, um, where the response is so, to all become like Ingmar Bergman. You know, let's write a really dark, deep, depressing script about this and film it in black, you know, and then, 
and then look at it and look at it again. And, and, and that's, it's certainly a, a useful way for that particular culture, apparently. Um, but you, you Aussies uh, wouldn't dig that at all, I don't think, right? Um, you you um, put on new flip-flops and go shovel, shovel the shit in the streets, right? And, um, and, and be neighborly about it. She'll be right, mate, you need a coffee, you know? And... and um, I, my, my phone isn't working. I've got a radio, you know, and, and so it's, it's, there's, there's this spontaneous um, uh, ability for resilience that seems to be very much part of the cultural DNA that you guys probably had to do when you were dumped at Botany Bay, you know. I mean, <laughs> she'll be right, mate. <laughs> yeah. Um, so perhaps this is, this is written on how the country was started and how it has had to fight to become what it is today, that you're not easily phased. So I'm, I'm quite optimistic about Australians, yeah. I, you know, I think it, it's a wonderful cultural reflection, but I, I think it, um, it misses the, um, the opportunity to not just kind of be friendly and neighborly and withstand and go through it all again in 10 years' time, <laughs> But to actually be strategic and smart and pull together and actually invest our taxpayer dollars, our charitable donations. Right. Are we less optimistic on that, that one? Just, no, I remain uh, optimistic, but I just think it's a structural thing. Yeah. You have to actually go back to the community and say, you are now empowered to help us figure out how to spend this money. And you know what? We're going to give you access to the best engineers, actuaries, you know, uh, industry developers, community developers, artists, whoever they want to talk to, and then see what's possible. How exciting could that be? What happens, though, if you do that from the community consultation level um, in detail, find out what people want and what they want isn't a sustainable vision of the future? I mean, what if at a community consultation level they want something different? It's great. I'm not here to... <laughs> I reckon if people want blue instead of green, fine. <laughs> you know, the, the, the idea is that... Um, uh, we, we all must love democracy at this stage, you know, at every level, state, local, federal. Um, we, we need new models of democracy that somehow, through this complexity, allow ordinary people to make decisions in a meaningful way. And so it, it, it doesn't mean that um, I know what the answers are or that anyone knows what the answers are, but it's interesting. If people are clear that there are trade-offs between, you know, water and safety, between food and energy, between all of these complex things, they can help navigate those trade-offs. You know, we're not mugs. Um, so, but consultation is one thing. Real deliberation and empowering people to actually make decisions, that's something else. And uh, I'm excited. I totally share your optimism. But I think my children have a better chance of getting a new play park at Milton, which is still fenced off, than a new model for democracy. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you cynic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I agree with you. But I think that's a, that's a, a long road. Did you know, here's a funny story. You know how New South Wales has problems with roads and trains and how every election in Sydney and everything else is about that? Uh, New Democracy is a wonderful uh, organization. Um, it has a foundation and it looks at these models and they've been uh, carefully looking at opportunities to influence through citizenship engagement, local government planning decisions, investments. Nick Reiner, who's very involved in that foundation, also is now responsible for infrastructure in New South Wales. And do you know what? They're going to start taking those decisions to the people. Actually look at infrastructure, roads, and so forth. It's such a powerful model. It makes so much sense. Mm. But I, I think you're right. We've, your kids are looking at a place <laughs> you know, probably quicker. But unless we start talking about this in the context of these events, then we're never going to get there. The, and when, uh, sorry, go ahead, Kate. And I'm just wondering, Matt, when those questions and story opportunities come back to the people who've been affected, are we hearing all the stories? Is there, are there groups that are silenced <clears throat> by this? Well, I got an email from a, um, an, a friend at the University of Queensland just two days ago. He said, I, I would like to be at your session, but I'm, I'm busy, but could you talk about this? And he had been affected personally in the flood. His, his house had been flooded, and he's been in a 12-month battle with the, with the insurance company. And um, he's, he's talked to a lot of people and developed, and, and, and developed what he believes is, has the data for what he believes is a scandal. And, and that's just one little side of this whole 
scenario one year on. My wife is a psychologist and her specialty is childhood resilience. And the stories that she comes brings home about um, the children of this state a year later and how um, their fears and, and, and so on are manifesting themselves now, um, to me is, is an indication potentially that the full impact of our disaster uh, is just starting to be felt. So there are many, many things happening that we're not all cognizant of, if you like, um, silent things, hidden things that, that, that this event has uh, rip, rippled through. Um, yeah. And that might perhaps underline the question of whether we should be talking about recovery or whether we should be talking about resilience because they're not necessarily the same thing, are they? They're not the same, no. Recovery seems to suggest sort of the, 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 the medical model in which you go back to a pre-existing level of health uh, and that otherwise things remain the same. Uh, I think that, that significantly misconstrues um, both the psychological, the social, but even the architectural responses after a disaster like this. Resilience means that you are able to respond to and adapt and absorb the challenges that put you outside of what you were used to or what you thought you could handle. And as a result, you come out differently. We have a different configuration of your social environment, your built environment, your psychological makeup. And what is interesting, and, and, and Matt's wife certainly must see this as well, is of course the question, how do some people, some communities, adapt very well to this, like Greenberg, Greensburg? In, in Kansas, and, and how do some people or communities adapt less well? What is it that accounts for these differences? I think the science on that is only just starting to give us some clues, not even answers. Well, that actually seems like a good point to turn to you as an audience um, and to hear comments or questions from you. But first of all, I'll remind you that with us today is Mara Bun, Chief Executive of Green Cross Australia, Professor Sydney Decker from Griffith University School of Humanities and an expert on system failure and governance, and Matt Condon, journalist, editor of Q Weekend and an author with many books to his name. All three, of course, have written for the latest issue of Griffith's Review. But now would be a good time to hear from you in the audience, and I imagine we might get some, some light so I can actually see who, um, who has a question or a comment there. And feel free to introduce yourself as well if you'd like to. Uh, uh, Louise Denoon from State Library. Um, thanks for a great session and lots of sort of thoughts going um, and thinking about. Uh, one of them is uh, last week there was a session here on disaster preparedness for libraries nationally and we had people from New Zealand as well as people talking here and one of the best presentations was from the Cardwell Historical Society and the impact that had happened uh, to their museum that was totally destroyed um, and then talked through what the council had done and the recovery people and in the end they lost the oldest building in the um, which was their museum in the town, was totally knocked down and a replica built. It was a very sad and heartfelt story, in fact, where Cardwell is trying to recover from the recovery. Um, you know, that actually the recovery and the impact. So I sort of... Um, I think there's great opportunities within this, but I also see that communities are you know, that they've moved off the media cycle, they're sitting, um, and that some of these stories that are happening, that Main Roads is running the recovery and that the big truck stop is going to... You know, like, it just felt like the absolute opposite of what Mara was talking about, of engaging and involving a community, and that so many people are still not in their homes. So I suppose it is that... You know, and it is different sitting here in Brisbane so far away, not knowing the scale of that sense of it. So I suppose it's more a comment than a, um, than a question, but about how we recover from the recovery and the impact of this sudden influx of help and then <laughs> disappearing again. Would anybody like to respond to that? Well, this is a well-known phenomenon in disaster res response in general, which I'm sure Myra is very familiar with and must have ranted and raved against as well, that the, 
uh, in part driven by the media cycle. The initial response seems uh, often even over the top, and you sense stuff that they have absolutely no use for, um, and uh, can be badly coordinated but over-resourced. Um, but very quickly, that sort of support starts starts waning and eroding, um, and it, uh, it it is very difficult. And this is this goes across disasters in the world to keep generating the types of support, both resources but also media attention, that are necessary to complete a recovery. Um, the recipe on how to deal with that well hasn't been uh, hasn't been found yet. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a good reflection. I um, I was so moved uh, by a story from Flowerdale, uh, you know, in the heart of, of Black Saturday, uh, where the publican from Darwin, who had been through Cyclone Tracy, sent a bag of cash to the Flowerdale pub, and basically in this envelope put a little note saying, you guys are about to get hit with everything you don't need in large volumes. I want you to keep this under the tiller and just spend it as you need it. <laughs> that is cool. <laughs> and uh, it's wonderful because Flowerdale is, is an interesting place. It's an example of, I guess, if you had a measure of what is resilience, I was really so inspired and moved by the response. Um, there are stories of how the CFA left before the bushfire, and so they were left with ordinary sort of people many of whom were equipped in that kind of Bush Australian know-what-to-do way. And the reason why they were so resilient is because they knew each other. Mm. And they knew who needed help and who could help and who had backup generators and who yeah. had hoses and who was stuck at home and in a wheelchair and whatnot. And they just experienced extreme tragedy. It wasn't, you know, a cakewalk. It was a really, really difficult time and lives were lost and many homes uh, were entirely lost, but many lives were saved by that kind of attitude. And so I think part of the secret is, and in Queensland, that's again why I'm so optimistic. I've been here now for seven years, and I just love the fact that people do know their neighbors. <laughs> you know, I moved here from Sydney, and it's just such a different feeling. So hopefully that, combined with um, different models of, you know, kind of empowering people about what happens during recovery, we can just slow down the media cycle. It doesn't have to happen in the first week, you know? We have to think and feel and come together in the first several months and then wonderful things can come. Um, your, Louise, your comment, um, and excuse the simplicity of this analogy, but it reminded me of a friend last year whose marriage dissolved. So he had a personal disaster. He didn't stop talking about it for six months. It's her fault, and this is what happened. At her. <laughs> and now he doesn't talk about it at all. He's moved on and he's living his life. And maybe, in a sense, that's what human beings do. Um, and maybe communities en masse do that too. Are there other questions? We're, we're obviously dealing with an extremely complex topic and you can handle it on many levels and you've got many objectives. Just thinking about two of the things associated with survival and resilience, <clears throat> one is obviously what we're going to build afterwards, which we've discussed, and the other is uh, how are people going to be prepared for the event that is going to come again, which is, seems to me to be a given, even if we do a great job with doing things different. What's exercising my mind is the changes that have occurred in our society in the last 20 or 30 years in terms of, because to achieve some of those objectives you need to move away from an individual focus and a focus on yourself and you perhaps have, have a greater sense of community and perhaps there's a role for government which is less acceptable nowadays when we seem every day to get on the, in the newspapers avoiding becoming a nanny state, whatever that may mean. So I think there's a lot of conundrums in there in terms of what we need to achieve those two objectives that I've focused on and the changes in our society which may help or impede that. So I wonder whether you'd like to make any comments about those. I was, um, uh, if I may, I was thinking about um, uh, 
the, the gentleman's point, actually, without him having made it yet, uh, but when, when Mara uh, laid out her appeal to, uh, to people that for the first 72 hours when this hits you, you're going to be on your own. Um, and I do believe there is probably some truth value in the idea that, say, uh, half a century ago, that distance between how we normally get taken care of and how we all of a sudden might be on our own wasn't uh, as, as large as it is now. We, we may have come to believe that all the answers are on the iPad, which of course requires electricity and, and you know, polls sending data to this thing, um, that uh, the government takes care of everything. We can hand our brain on a platter to, to various organizations and institutions, and they'll do the thinking for us, even with OSHA and truly very straightforward, commonsensical things. Um, to all of a sudden, given that cultural context, be confronted by being left utterly alone um, as, as, as human beings who are not coordinated in any way and may actually not know their neighbors, uh, even in Brisbane, but, but um, is, could be deeply traumatic and, and, and create significant shock and some delay for them to respond meaningfully. But again, I arrived when it had hit, so um, perhaps Matt has different experiences from his, his time in the streets. No, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated with all the talk of um, community tonight, and I was just remembering back to my little community, which is Rosalie and Paddington. And just as my children and all the children of those herringbone streets will run amok on the night of Halloween... Um, and, and join and glue together all of these disparate little houses are suddenly one. Um, and to see that the work of, of the residents down at um, Baruna Road in, in Rosalie and, and the help and the incredible work that they did together, um, it's a very good point that ca can we capitalise on that, that village? Can we live as a village in a city? I think I'm fascinated by that notion. It's a beautiful notion. And, and part of the challenge of that notion in Queensland, of course, we're a very large state and we're growing and we're attracting new people and we have a lot of mobility within the state. So we have pockets of that and then we have newcomers that come into that pocket. How do we, through schools, through Rotary, through community events, kind of replicate that kind of culture? It's a fascinating question. Green Cross is working with the city of Melbourne on helping them develop a climate change adaptation network for inner city Melbourne. Uh, Melbourne has identified four key risks, uh, inundation, urban heat island effect, um, you know, storm surge, uh, floods, and so forth. And we're involving everyone, community, business, government, and so forth, in that network of discussion. And um, the University of Melbourne did research with uh, the city government, which is just so funny. They interviewed residents in Carlton who had been in a housing estate, had lived there forever, had, you know, all kinds of uh, experiences locally. And then yuppie couples in high-rises in Docklands, right, which is the flash new development in the south of Melbourne. And they asked them the same questions about disaster preparedness, understanding resilience. And the most interesting <laughs> results were the people in Carlton knew exactly what to do. <laughs> And the people in Docklands were like, well, I call, you know, the SES. It's like, well, you don't have a phone. <laughs> so, and it, that's that mobility and integrating that into the complexity of this rich culture that we have in Queensland, I think it's wonderful because uh, we have social media now as well as the mainstream media kind of if changing. We have power. But be, before, you know, yeah, before the events know. happen, we can begin to kind of inculcate this culture. Got it. But do we have to attend street parties? That would be my question. <laughs> now, we have um, probably time only for one more. Thanks. Um, hi, I'm interested to get your impressions on the idea of spontaneous volunteering. Um, so you've talked about that optimism in the first 72 hours where communities are sort of, you know, it's them, it's up to them. Um, and the way that that is getting almost in institutionalised and controlled um, in a positive way, obviously, in many cases, um, particularly in areas sort of outside of metropolitan areas um, where those systems, you know, are already very strong and um, I guess the effect on organisations like Volunteer in Queensland who are coming in and, and um, working with that. I'll, I'll have a go at that. Um, I, I, I think uh, Volunteer in Queensland uh, has much to teach 
the rest of the country and really the rest of the world. Um, you know, in terms of the events of, of last year and that mass uh, group of volunteers, um, there's 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 two underlying challenges. Uh, one is at the same time as we need to find a structure in this world of liability and clear definition and so forth, you know, we have to find a structure for people to spontaneously come forward when they may not be qualified, they may not, you know, have a driver's license or know how to do first aid when they offer it and so forth. Um, but on the other hand, we also have to find ways to rejuvenate and restructure in somehow the flexibility of our official emergency response volunteering agencies. Because they also, the Red Cross, the SES, St. John Ambulance, they also, I think, could greatly benefit from having spontaneous support if it's pre-qualified, if there's a system beforehand to funnel through and identify what people can do if they wanted to spontaneously. And this is a major challenge for Australia. We have 500,000 emergency volunteers. And uh, they are what we call the surge capacity in our emergency response system. So they may not be there for 72 hours, but when they come boy, are we happy that they're there. And the average age is kind of around 50. And for some agencies, the average age is over 60. And I've heard stories uh, from Neil Roberts, you know, the former outgoing emergency uh, response minister, going to Cyclone Larry and being in the plane with SES volunteers, some of whom were popping heart pills. (laughs) And I've heard stories from CFA volunteers in Black Saturday who could see 70-year-old people in their uniforms out there fighting. I mean, we, we have got to rejuvenate that capacity. So somehow we just have to get intelligent about what is the model for volunteering, but it's very exciting because if anyone's going to crack it, it's going to be Queensland, and thank goodness for volunteering Queensland as, as part of that mix. Well, I should say then, Matthew Condon, Mara Boon, and Sydney Decker, thank you for joining us on Big Ideas on ABCRN and here at the State Library of Queensland and as part of the Griffith Review Survival and Resilience Edition. I'm Kate Evans and that's it from us, but we will be hearing again from Susan. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Kate, Matthew, Mara and Sydney. It was wonderful to have you here. And for those of you who have um, not yet had a chance to read um, our speakers' essays, there are some um, editions of Griffith Review for sale outside, so please pick one up. And we've also prepared some further reading notes for you if you're interested. You can pick up a copy outside. Otherwise, there'll be some available for download from the State Library website, along with a a podcast of tonight. Uh, It should be up there in the next few days. Um, We invite you all back here again soon to see Floodlines, uh, the exhibition I mentioned earlier. It'll be available for viewing in our two main galleries from April 7th. So so please do come and um, and, and witness some of these community stories that we've been collecting. Um, Good night. Thank you for coming, and we hope to see you all again here soon.